show of hands. Okay. And uh, then who walked here this evening? Good. And then how many people biked here this evening? One cyclist. Okay. And um, for those of you who were driving, how many uh, exceeded 60 miles per gallon? All right. We've got, we've got a hand here. And how many exceeded 50 miles per gallon? 40 miles per gallon? Here we go, another hand, good. 30 miles per gallon. That's a little more popular. 25 miles per gallon. Okay, and 20 miles per gallon. I won't ask the rest of that question line. How many are visiting from further away than 10 miles? Okay, and uh, how far away are you coming from? 40 miles, 20 miles. How far are you coming from? 55. 55 miles. How many? How many do we have in here that are associated with uh, organic farming? We've got some organic farming, and you're from 20 miles away here. 15. 15 miles away. Okay. And then, <clears throat> how many environmental engineering students do we have? No environmental engineering students? Here we, here we go. And transportation engineering students? Okay. Uh, how many students do we have? Lots of students. We just don't have the, uh, the fields correct, huh? So how many are in the uh, college of business? Okay. Arts and letters? Uh, let's see. Uh, should we go to... Uh, Fashion merchandising. <laughs> my daughter is a student here at Iowa State. My my wife is also an alumni, and uh, my sister Karen went to school here. So we've got a lot of heritage here at that, uh, at Iowa State. I am journeying here from La Crosse, Wisconsin, and uh, we're on the mighty Mississippi River. And I have been going out to uh, universities and technical colleges, high schools. I've given up third grade now, but uh, I have tried that. I've uh, presented at Sierra Clubs and Rotary Clubs and uh, Audubon Societies and classic car collectors. And most anywhere there, where there is some semblance of interest in hybrid compressed natural gas or fuel cell technology. I've attempted to make myself available, particularly in the upper Midwest, although I have presented at Arizona State University and at um, Soul Fest out in Northern California as well. So now that I have that part said, are any of you in the wrong room? <laughs> no? Good, you're all here. Thank you very much for coming out. Uh, John? Did you want to, uh, now that the setup is complete, did you want to go ahead and acknowledge your, acknowledge your, um, I was just going to do a brief introduction, but before I started, introduce yourself. Very good. Why don't you go right ahead? Okay. Do you need to borrow this? Yeah, How about, can you use this one right here? Sure. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, thanks everybody for coming. Um, my name is John Tillo. I'm uh, a Student Environmental Council President. Um, if you guys are interested in Student Environmental Council at all, you can talk to me after class as well. And uh, hopefully, I see a couple of you guys out in the audience as well, so that's awesome. Um, thank you, Chris, for coming tonight. Uh, it's, it's our pleasure to host you. It's hopefully going to be a good time, and we'll learn a lot. And uh, who knows, maybe we'll get a potential customer out of this as well. I don't know. But uh, uh, more than anything, it's really informative. And uh, Chris has been on many, um, he's been on Wisconsin Public Radio several times in the, in the past year. And he's a well-known uh, speaker on hybrid cars and hybrid technology. So we're really thankful to have him here. And uh, I just want to be um, the first to say uh, thanks a lot. Thank you, thank you John. 
And do you have time for questions afterwards? Will we have a question and answer session? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Very Great. good. Great. Great. We'll sit down. Thanks. Thank you, John. Thank you to your council. Uh, I mentioned I'm from La Crosse, Wisconsin, on the mighty Mississippi. And for those of you who may not have been there, the Mississippi River has carved some very significant bluffs in our area. And we call it the Cooley region. And these bluffs are about 500 feet tall in our particular neck of the woods. So there's some great mountain biking. And there's some great hiking. And there's lots of kayaking and canoeing. And um, some great soccer fields and lots of other reasons to be outdoors. One of the reasons that I chose to be outdoors was to be involved in scouting. And uh, it turns out that um, I was able to become an Eagle Scout and uh, my scout leader is here this evening, and I'd like to recognize him. <laughs> this is my, my father, Carl Schneider. From <laughs> and he also has paid some tuition. And next to him is my mother, Narcel Schneider. <laughs> and uh, they sometimes um, know me as, as the hybrid guru, but um, the person who knows me here as dad is my daughter, and that's Sabrina, next door to my mother. So I spent a lot of time outdoors as, uh, to, to become an Eagle Scout, and I really grew an appreciation for the outdoors and growing up in lacrosse. Uh, I then wanted to do something. Um, uh, I decided that I would like to, to uh, get involved in the, in the car business, but I wanted to develop fuel efficient engines for Volkswagen of America. And so I went off to engineering school at Notre Dame, and I uh, have a degree in mechanical engineering. Um, I then returned to lacrosse, and before I could get to work for Volkswagen of America, they were leaving uh, Pennsylvania, and so I didn't get a chance to work for them. And I got into the retail side. I enjoyed it a great deal. And I've spent over a quarter of a century um, in the industry. And so I have a little bit of a unique perspective on the market of hybrids because I uh, have an engineering degree and understand how the technology works. And yet, I'm also in the marketing side of it. Um, beyond my engineering degree, uh, I would say that the outdoor activities that my children have been involved in has made me want to make um, our, our air, our, our land, and our water a little better than it's been. Uh, the Mississippi River, I'm happy to tell you, is healthier today than it was. The, the symbol of its health is uh, during <laughs> our River Fest in La Crosse, that's usually about the time that uh, the, 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 we call them mayflies, but this usually happens in June or July, and they come out, and they come out in droves now. When the river was not as healthy as it was, contaminants along the bottom would prevent them from hatching. And so the good news is now, when our uh, festival is interfered with, because of the enormous amount of bugs, it means it's a good thing. Uh, my specialty is talking about transportation, but when I go to energy fairs, like the Iowa Energy Fair, or the Illinois Energy Fair, or the Midwest Renewable Energy Fair, there's other people that are there talking about how much oil we have. And I'm in the middle of reading a book called The End of Oil, and it has, it's been very well researched, and there's lots of interesting documentation about how much oil is left in Mother Earth. Um, and I'm not going to debate how much there is. If we look at optimistic or pessimistic viewpoints, it could be from 30 to 50 years, and there's new techniques and more being found. But you know, as I put myself in the shoes of my 11-year-old son, and I say 30 or 50 years projected from then, what will the alternatives be for him? What will the alternatives be for my daughters? And when I start to look at that, I have to say, one of the things that my engineering professors told me is less is more. Simpler is better. And we're going to be talking about that. I removed this from my stop and think board here. And we're going to be talking a little bit about trying to stop and think tonight also. Okay? The most important thing that I can do tonight is to answer your questions. 
because I have made this presentation or presentations like this often in lots of different places, talking to lots of different people with different perspectives. And quite frankly, it's your perspective on the subject that's the most important. So if I say something or if I fail to say something, please raise a hand and ask a question. I'll be, ha be happy to answer them at any time. But before we get started, I should warn you, even though we're talking about some engineering here tonight, I'm going to start with history. So do we have any history majors here tonight? Okay, we've got a history major. Maybe our history major will be able to identify this vehicle. See, now I'm holding stuff up. I want you to know that I have a low energy usage presentation here. <laughs> and I always get a nice, a nice response when I'm at the energy fairs. But the energy that I'm bringing is mine and, and your question. So you'll have to bear with me. This picture is the picture of a very first automobile in the world. Anybody recognize it? Go ahead, raise your hand. If you can answer the question I, I brought, I brought prizes with me. <laughs> Anybody recognize this one? This uh, car was produced seven years before the United States of America was officially documented on July 4th, 1776. This car was produced in France in 1769, and it's a steam-powered car, and Nicolas Cagnot built this car, and most of the images on the internet that you'll find with this car are it having crashed into a stone wall. You see, he did a very good job of propelling it forward but not such a good job with the braking. <laughs> braking is good. And we're going to talk more about braking tonight. We're going to be talking about a very special braking system called regenerative braking. Regenerative braking. But before we talk about regenerative braking, let's continue our history lesson. Anybody recognize this guy right here? I'll give you some hints. He was born seven days after July 4th on July 11th. He was born in Wales in 1811, and he did something very special in 1839 when he was 28 years old. And my, my uh, son, who was nine at the time, and I developed a gas pump pinata, and we hang up this gas pump pinata in our showroom floor to celebrate his birthday every year, and we encourage people to come in and bash the gas pump. Anybody know why we're bashing the gas pump on Sir William Robert Rowe's birthday? We're bashing the gas pump because in 1839, he developed what we know today as the fuel cell. The fuel cell. 1839. Some of you might remember 1969 when a man went to the moon and they took a fuel cell with them. 130 years later. Now we fast forward from 1839 to 1847, and unfortunately I don't have a picture of Moses Farmer's car, but he was an American who developed the very first full electric vehicle. 1847, full electric vehicle. It wasn't until almost 40 years later that Gottlieb Daimler and Carl Benz developed the very first gasoline-powered car in Germany, okay, 40 years later. If the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, was here in this country then, when they started coming in or we started developing in here, they'd be saying, why would you want to put that liquid bomb in a car when we've got these great electric-powered vehicles? But unfortunately, the EPA wasn't here. But not too long after 1886, in 1892, an organization called the Sierra Club was formed. And there were still very few gasoline-powered cars in this country, and fewer smokestack industries than there are today, and yet these people were forward-thinking enough to know that our environment needed protecting, and yet, as forward-thinking as they were, they never gave away a product award until January of 2000. 108 years later, the Sierra Club gave away their first product award to American Honda. And the president of the Sierra Club, Carl Pope, says, 
I feel like the proverbial man that bit the dog. Here's an environmental organization giving away a product award to an automobile manufacturer. Maybe the last person, the last entity on earth that you would expect to, but they knew what was going to happen. They could see the revolution, and that's one of the things that we want to talk about tonight in hybrid technology. That's why I brought this little piece of a tailpipe from a Honda Insight. We're going to talk more about the environmental benefits, but before we do, we need to make it to the turn of the century. And I'm not talking about Y2K here for you students. I'm talking about the early 1900s, and this is one of at least a half a dozen examples in this country. <laughs> and Dr. Porsche in Germany actually developed gasoline electric hybrids. If this stuff's 100 years old, I guess we can go home now. <laughs> There's nothing to talk about. 100 years old. But I did bring something else with me along with the tailpipe, and that is a nickel metal hydride battery module. And along with this module, I brought a battery pack from a Honda Insight. Okay? This is a battery pack from a Honda Insight hybrid. There would be 20 of those battery modules in this package if it were full. There'd be 20 of these in there. And if it were full, it would have a voltage capacity of 144 volts. If you look real carefully, and I am going to pass this around, you'll see that there's actually six D cell size nickel metal hydride batteries in this module. So there's 120 in total. And if this were charged, it would represent 7.2 volts, which is just about two thirds of a 12 volt lead acid battery. And a typical 12 volt lead acid battery weighs 30 pounds. So we would expect this at two thirds to weigh 20 pounds. And I'm not actually a weightlifter. I'm a mountain biker, and so I'm going to pass this around because all 20 of these batteries together actually weigh 48 pounds instead of the 360 that we might expect. And so there's seven times the voltage capacity per pound in a nickel metal hydride battery than a lead acid. As you can tell by the volume of that package that I held up, there's about three to four times the voltage capacity per cubic inch. And these are the reasons that gas electric hybrid cars were not popular 100 years ago. They weighed too much, and the batteries took up too much of the space. Along with this battery, I brought a power control unit. This is the brain of the hybrid system. This is what makes the decisions about when the hybrid system works for you. And this brain is making sure that that battery module is being completely charged before it's being completely discharged. And thereby reducing the opportunity for it to develop a memory. And because of the power control unit doing that, all of these systems that we're talking about here tonight in hybrid vehicles are designed to live the life of the vehicle. And to do that, maintenance-free. See, there's no oil to change. There's no air filters. There's no valves to adjust. There's no timing belt, no timing chains. You still do have to accomplish all of those things on the gasoline engine that this is being coupled with, but you're not adding any maintenance by adding the electrical components. In one of the presentations I gave, I had a guy who raised his hand and he said, I've had a refrigerator running for 50 years. And I had to stop a moment and think, now, did I tell him that I work on, on developing one and a half to five ton residential heat pumps for train heat and air conditioning that's headquartered in La Crosse? Why is he talking about refrigeration? And then, of course, it dawned on me, he was talking about the fact that there was an electrical motor in his air conditioning system on his, uh, his uh, refrigerator that had been operating for 50 years 
with no maintenance. That's what electric motors that are brushless and sealed, like they are in the hybrid systems that we're talking about here tonight, that's what they can accomplish on, on a, um, I'm not saying 50 years on a regular basis, but a very long time. The, the hybrid that I brought that might need to have a quarter foot in a meter um, it, uh, here is it's outside here and it has 98,000 miles on it and it's the fifth insight that I've personally driven to 100,000 miles. So we've seen very good durability. The person who won our driving clinic this last October uh, had 161,000 miles on his insight and he averaged 85.0 miles per gallon. So you were you were getting here and getting over a friend drove you. So you were averaging the two of you then in, in the car that was getting 25. She bought a hybrid. Great. Good for her. Congratulations on on having a friend making a good decision. Yes, sir. How many total kilowatts? That's a good question. Are you an electrical engineer? Computer. Computer engineer. Maybe you can help me that. It has a total capacity of 144 volts, and the uh, motor can accept up to six amp hours. Okay? Can you do the calculations for me? You know, I'm a mechanical engineer, so all this electrical stuff, I hate to say it, is gone down. <laughs> I can tell you this, that as you're driving the vehicle, it is always making decisions about whether it should be charging and assisting. It does it all the time without you making any decisions. So regardless of what the capacity in the system is at any given moment that you could measure, it is always doing things. And we'll, we can talk a little bit about a typical driving experience. When you first start the car, you know right away it's different because it's the electric motor that starts the car, not a starter motor. So you're not <coughs> signaling a solenoid to kick out a gear to engage a flywheel. And that process, you hear a noise. And if you've been in the industry as long as I have, you can identify a Volkswagen starting from a Honda, Ford, General Motors. But unfortunately with hybrids, you can't do that anymore because you're sending a signal to the power control unit to take energy from the nickel metal hydride batteries and send it forward to the electric motor, and it's the electric motor that turns the gasoline engine over. You supply spark and gasoline, and all of a sudden the tachometer jumps to life and you hear the gasoline engine running. So you know right away it's a unique experience. Then as you start to move forward, both the gasoline engine and the electric motor will work together to give you more acceleration. This car that I'm driving is a one liter three cylinder. It's a very small gasoline engine, but because I've got an electric motor, it performs like a 1.5 liter engine. So it's a much larger feeling acceleration. And as I'm watching the gauge, it's showing me that the electric motor is assisting me in acceleration. Once I reach steady state, okay, whether that's going along Lincoln Way at 30 miles an hour, or I-35 at 70 miles an hour, the power control unit can say, we use energy from our battery system and we need to recharge it. And it'll, it'll tell the uh, electric motor to become a, a very mild generator. And it will harness, it will trickle charge just a little bit. Because the insight that I'm driving has the lowest drag coefficient of any mass-produced car in automotive history at 0.25. And what that means is it cheats the wind so well that it requires less than 20 horsepower to keep it going 60 miles an hour. And so even a one liter three-cylinder is capable of putting out three times the power needed to keep it going at highway speeds. So it can just skim a little excess energy, triple charge the batteries, but what's even greater than the triple charging mode is I start coming off the interstate on the 13th and I'm coming down to the stop sign, I'm depressing the brake pedal. And 
instead of signaling the brake pads to engage the brake rotors, I'm signaling the electric motor to become a super generator. And it slows me down and harnesses the energy that I normally would have been losing in metal-on-metal -metal contact energy to the environment, heat in the form of heat. It takes that, at least a, a part of it, and it charges the electrical system. I like to think of the regenerative braking system as the point in which I'm driving that I'm producing gasoline out of thin air. <laughs> <laughs> gasoline out of thin air. It's sort of like turning water into gold, huh? Instead of storing the energy in a liquid gasoline form of the tank, it's storing it as electrical charge in the nickel metal hydride batteries. And approximately one third of the power in the insight maximum power can come from the electric motor. Okay? So now we're slowing down, we're making energy out of nothing in the case of comparing it to a conventional car, and then all of a sudden it quits. The gas engine stops running. And you're thinking, now, how far do I have to walk back to Honda Motor Works in a car? And so you take your foot off the brake pedal, or you put it in gear, and instantaneously the electric motor restarts the gasoline engine, and you're ready to take off. The next time it goes to auto stop, you're sitting there and you're saying, boy, it sure is quiet. And there's not a vibration whatsoever. Oh, and I'm not burning any gasoline. And I'm not putting out any emissions. And the federal government says the average American wastes 16.2% idle. <coughs> Boy, this is really cool. And all cars should be like this. And magically the light turns green. You put it in gear, take your foot off the automatic, brake pedal, boom, instantaneously you're ready to take off again. And the next time it happens, you start celebrating and saying, you know. I don't have the same kind of feeling about coming to a stoplight and sitting there and wondering when it's going to turn to green anymore. I can focus on more important things like when my next bicycle ride is, when I get to take my son to school, when I get to have my parents visit me in Central Iowa, when I get to drive down and visit my daughter at Iowa State. And so you get a whole different attitude about driving, and believe me when I tell you, it's a very positive thing. So that's a typical driving experience, and it's one of the reasons why having to do the math on the electricity itself, although it's very important, and for any of you considering a career in the transportation field that are interested in hybrids, compressed natural gas, or fuel cell vehicles, I certainly encourage you to send me an email and I will talk to the people who will help answer that question for me. They won't answer all of my questions. You know, some of this stuff is uh, intellectual properties and patent and stuff. And, uh, you know, if they told me, they'd have to kill me. And <laughs> that I wouldn't be able to come out here and, and do this. A question back here. Is this technology a reference? Uh, Yeah, it's funny you mentioned trains, because uh, they, they play a big part in their games, don't they? And trains are great examples of diesel electric hybrid vehicles. You see the diesel plume coming out, but they're actually charging batteries and they're being propelled by electric motors. Um, some people know hybrids as submarines, and early ones were diesel electric, more modern ones are nuclear electric. Have you ever seen those those, uh, those dump trucks, and not the ones that are on the highway out here, but the great big ones with the wheels that are as big as people that you climb up into, those are diesel electric hybrids also. So they've been around us <coughs> for decades. And like we talked about earlier, 
This is not a new concept. It's just that there's new technology out here today that's making them more successful. So let's talk about the success. Let's talk about what I can do for us. Okay, this board that I've developed is a board that I call my stop and think board, and I call it my gas mileage equivalent. If you go to the website that we've developed for people to learn more about hybrids, it's called hybridcarstore.com, or you can go to 4ahybrid.com, and I do have some contact information up here later if you'd like to get that website. But if you go to the front page and you go to related links, there's a site on there called insightcentral.net. This is not a website that was developed by a Honda dealer or American Honda or, or anyone else associated with hybrids other than their owners of hybrids. And they own Honda Insights and they go there and they register their mileage. When you go there, you find out that the average Insight owner is averaging 63 miles per gallon. And the example that I've used here is $2 a gallon for gasoline, and I'm not using $2 a gallon because I'm optimistic that they'll ever get there again. I'm using $2 a gallon because it makes the math really easy. See? Uh, my first year at Notre Dame, we were required to use a slide rule. We had to show our professors that we knew how to use them. But I got to buy a handheld calculator. It was pretty exciting because they were pretty new back then. And I can still remember my Texas Instruments. <coughs> it was a $189. And for those of you thinking that that's a lot of money, I'll remind you that that was in money about 30 years ago. Money. <laughs> And if I was driving one of those great big trucks and I filled up, I'd spend enough money that some gas stations might give me a free calculator, and that calculator would probably do all of the functions that my calculator did back then. Sometimes you go in and you have to buy them at about 10 bucks. So I give you that example because we're talking about what happens when technology starts to become so popular that production costs come down, and we certainly expect to see that to happen in the field of hybrids also. But we were talking about the $2 a gallon for gas to make the math easy, okay? If we were driving a fuel-efficient car today, and we averaged 31.5 miles per gallon, we know it would take two gallons to drive the same distance as the Insight driving on one gallon of gas and going 63 miles. We have to put two gallons in at two dollars. That's four dollars a gallon equivalent. So if you're driving a car today and you're getting 43 miles per gallon, and again, we had some people enter since I asked this earlier, who drove here today and is getting more than 43 miles per gallon? Your friend, one arm, okay? The equivalent would be two dollars and 93 cents a gallon. If you're driving a Honda Civic and you're getting 33 miles per gallon, you're doing very well, congratulations, and your gas mileage equivalent is $3.82 a gallon. If you're driving up in your, in your Buick and you're getting 23 miles per gallon, the, the gas mileage equivalent is $5.48 a gallon. If you drove here in your Hummer and you're bragging that you can't get 11 miles per gallon, then the gas mileage equivalent is $11.45. $11.45 per gallon. What I'd like to see is when you put your credit card in to pay for the gas, that there be a little chip in there and it says, I'm driving a Hummer and I'm proud that I'm not getting 11 miles per gallon, or I'm driving the Buick and I'm getting 23 miles per gallon, and it prints out your receipt, and at the bottom it says, your gas mileage equivalent is $11.45 a gallon. Would that help people stop and think? Well, some of them, I hope. But see, $11.45 a gallon corresponds to this Jeopardy answer that I got here. So I'm giving you the answer, and the question is, what the gas mileage equivalent of a hybrid of a Hummer owner is compared to an Insight owner at two dollars a gallon for gasoline. I was supposed to put that in question form, right? Because the answer is this. Okay. So now 
and, and I've got some great prizes. I've got some tire pressure gauges that are key chains also. Okay, so you can put them on your key and make sure that your tire pressures are good because the federal government tells us whether you're driving a hybrid or a diesel or a gas guzzler or a fuel cell, four tenths of a percent is lost for every pound that you're like. If you're four pounds light in all four tires, that's over six percent. It starts to add up, doesn't it? So I've got a great prize for you. Who's ever going to be able to give me the question? The answer is 6.3 billion miles daily. Who knows what the, what the question is? Yes, sir. How many miles do Americans drive each day? Look at there. See how wonderful that is? How simple and precise? That's exactly right. How many miles we as Americans drive every day? I used to think that 3.1 billion miles a day was a lot. Can you imagine how foolish I was? <laughs> to think that 3.1 billion miles was a lot. It's more than doubled in the time that I've been in the industry. Okay? 2.1 billion dollars weekly. <laughs> what does 2.1 billion dollars weekly represent? How much is spent on gas? That's very close. That's close enough that I'll give you one, but it has to be qualified, and maybe you've got the answer. That was my answer. Anyone else? It's how much we as Americans spend every week on foreign oil. The answer was foreign oil. For those of you doing the math, that's a little over $100 billion a year, and about 55% of what we spend on our gasoline is to foreign oil. Does that, does that scare any of you in here? Does that help put some perspective on, on what we're talking about here tonight? It does for me. Um, <clears throat> I don't like it to get political, and I don't plan on it, but... Imagine where we would be as a country if we didn't rely on $100 billion worth of stuff coming from outside the country. So uh, that's our, uh, our, uh, our jeopardy for this evening. My stop at Think sign actually has two sides to help put the financial perspective uh, in, into a little bit more perspective for people. These are more real-world examples. Now, one of the areas that it's not maybe not quite real-world is it's based on 20,000 miles a year. The average American, the federal government tells us, drives about 15,000 miles a year. Um, my wife drives what the average American does on top of the 20,000 miles. So um, I've got some pretty good examples of uh, just needing to basically double the math here. But uh, you can. You can provide whatever perspective you need to. At 20,000 miles a year, at $2 a gallon, a Honda Insight burns $635 worth of gas. The most popular car in the country is the Toyota Camry, and most of them are four-cylinder versions. It is rated at 24 and 34. It burns $1,380. Now, the Honda Accord, if you factor out the fleet sales of the Camrys is the number one selling car in the country. The good news is the math is the same. So it would cost you $62 a month more in gas alone driving the most popular car compared to a Honda Insight. The Honda Accord and the Toyota Camry together do not sell as many as the Ford F-150. The example that I have here is the small 4.3 liter V8. And using that example, it would cost you $2,450 a year in gasoline or $151 a month. If gasoline returns to $3 a gallon this Memorial Day, that would be $233 a month. Now, I know that if I asked my college student, could she do something with $233 a month? She would say that she could find something to do with an extra $233 a month. <clears throat> Maybe the greatest example that we have is a gentleman who used to commute from Prairie to Sheen, Wisconsin, to La Crosse every day. And he drove a Suburban. <clears throat> and I said, John, 
why you drive a Suburban? He said, well, Chris, I've got a great big boat to pull. And I said, John, you pull a great big boat to and from across every day for work? He said, Chris, are you crazy? I said, no, John, I'm just checking. <laughs> it seems you're the one that's driving the Suburban to him. John, how often do you drive your, or how often do you pull your boat? Well, about four times a year. John, you keep your Suburban, and here's a Civic Hybrid for you for free. You're giving me a, a Civic Hybrid? Well, not exactly me, John. It's the, the gas company that's going to give that vehicle to you. When gas was $1.70, he made his car payments on his new Civic Hybrid with his gas savings alone. Now, we know that Benjamin Franklin told us a penny saved is a penny earned. So when gasoline went to $3 a gallon, John is jumping up and down for joy because he's now earning money as well as making his car payments. Now, some of you might be able to relate to this too. Let's pretend that we're all Chevy Suburbans. And we used to travel 40,000 miles a year, and now we're going to travel 4,000 miles a year. We depreciate a lot less that way, don't we? Why? Between the Benjamin Franklin and the additional depreciation, John's probably making the car payment on his wife's car and his car just for making the simple decision to not drive a Chevy Suburban to and from work anymore. That's powerful, isn't it? Let's talk about the Sierra Club again. And my tailpipe, okay? See here, it's one inch. And what I've been meaning to do is to get a tailpipe from a Dodge Ram diesel pickup truck. And my hope is, is that I could cut this into six rings so that I could superimpose these six rings within the ring the diameter of a, a Dodge Ram diesel pickup truck. And maybe that's not the best example. I'm just using it because it's got the really big exhaust on it. Because the Insight that I drive is what's called a ULEV, or an ultra low emission vehicle. Does anybody in here know what a ULEV means in terms of hydrocarbons? Well, let me tell you. If we compare a typical 2000 model tailpipe car and measure what comes out the bottom, out the back of it. An ultra low emission vehicle like the one that I'm driving is producing 84% fewer hydrocarbons. 100% minus 84, 16, 16 times 696. Six people in the front row could all be driving one and producing fewer hydrocarbons than one typical? That sounds pretty good. What about if it was an automatic version and it was a SULEV or a super ultra low emission vehicle and it was producing 96% fewer hydrocarbons minus 4, 4 minus 25, 25? What if it was like my wife's Civic Hybrid and it was a partial zero emission vehicle, 98% 50 people? Now, I've got to be honest with you, the carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, the nitrous oxides, the, the, the benefits are not as positive as the hydrocarbons. Let's just say that it was only, we were only able to, in those areas, drive two or three cars to the one. If you were concerned about the air in your community, which one would you choose to drive? Okay, that's a pretty big environmental question, huh? All right. I also brought with me a cylinder head from a Civic, and I can go into more details about that. Um, I brought with me a really neat, um, <laughs> a really neat picture right here, and it's going to be very difficult for everybody to see. But this is a picture that goes back several years ago of a gas station, and the price of uh, regular is uh, one arm, and the special is one leg, and the supreme is firstborn. <laughs> Does anybody ever go to the gas station and feel this way? Is it going to get better? No. 
And that's where hybrids come in. They're a great solution. And, and, uh, and so we've talked a little bit about hybrids. I do also want to talk about compressed natural gas and fuel cell vehicles. But before I do, I just want to make sure that there aren't any questions out here in regards to hybrid vehicles. Yes, sir. Um, we've got a professor here who's been doing some research and he's nodding his head yes also. There is waiting lists for new ones. The waiting lists have come down. Uh, the, well, at one point there was, they, uh, I had somebody in here say their mom was waiting for two years. Yeah, John, uh, he was saying his mom was waiting for two years. And a lot of times it got to nine months. Right now the waiting list is a lot less than that. But what we do, in lacrosse is we offer other solutions. We call them pre-owned, sometimes we call them certified, and when we certify, it takes the warranty to 100,000 miles. In many cases, it's a warranty that's better than a brand new one. We just happen to have the largest selection of pre-owned hybrids in the, in the, in the country, and uh, my dad has done some research in New Zealand, uh, and so, there's a guy there who specializes in them, and we've got about uh, four times as many as him, so I don't know, maybe we have the most in the world, but I'm not sure. We have about 50. And we would recommend that you consider those solutions. And the reason, the reason that I mention that is because, I'm not sure where my battery is, but the manufacturers, Honda and Toyota, they're not saying we don't want to supply more and, and have more hybrid owners. They, they have relationships with suppliers, and there is the Panasonic or a Sanyo million square foot building laying somewhere, them saying, well, as soon as you tell us to build more, you know, when, when you build it, they will come. Those, those facilities are at maximum capacity. There are, um, President Bush just visited Milwaukee, and Johnson Controls might get into the business, and hopefully there'll be other people who also say, We've got some production space available. We'll pay you, you know, patent rights or international or, or intellectual property rights on stuff and we'll produce more and we'll get the benefit of having done the research and develop it. So we hope that they will build more, definitely. But that's a very good question. Yes, sir. Yes, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the differences uh, research wise between incremental hydride and uh, lithium ion batteries. There's a lot of research going on about. And the second question I had is that last evening the auto show, there was a uh, Honda EV with a five minute charge time. There are rumors it's going to be any other production next year. Okay, lithium batteries and then full electric vehicles is the question there. Oh, thank you very much. Here's nickel metal hydride. Let's talk a little bit about lithium. And lithium ion has some real benefits. You know, we were talking about the comparison of nickel metal hydride and uh, lead acid. And, and uh, <clears throat> lithium ion has a lot of benefits in terms of weight and, and volume. Um, the, the, only, the only challenge is, is that to date, the technology has, has chosen this as, as their solution. Is this the ultimate solution? Absolutely not. Uh, has Honda gone beyond lithium ion? In my opinion, absolutely. They've gone to ultra capacitors in their newest fuel cell. And they will accept and reject electrical charge even more rapidly. The challenge with ultra capacitors is they'll discharge to the environment more rapidly. So if you're going to park your fuel cell car at the airport and leave it there for two weeks, you know, when you come back to it. So the solution is you put a nickel metal hydride battery back up, or maybe you put a lithium ion. Um, there's a company in California that's doing a lot of research with lithium ion because it will extend the serviceable range. They, they call them plug-in hybrids. So you can potentially drive 20 miles to and from work and run on full electric only. 
And if you've got solar panels at your home or wind generators up by Williams, Iowa, we visited there today, lots of generators up there. Um, maybe you're near a hydroelectric, maybe you're near ocean wave, a biomass, biogas, um, beacon. Your, your uh, Iowa State has a facility over here in Nevada that's doing some great work on biomass energy conversion. He's got six systems in a great big building there. They're kind of little models. Um, Which kind of Cal? Well, Cal Cars is doing it, but he's saying that E Drive is a company that's talking about marketing these systems. And my only concern is that currently, with the level of production and interest, it ranges from ten to twelve thousand dollars plus installation. And see, we've got pre-owned hybrids for that kind of money, and you don't need to have a hybrid to put that system onto. So until a major manufacturer gets in there and brings production down and makes it more marketable to the mainstream, is that a diesel electric hybrid going by? <laughs> is that the marching band? <laughs> Are we in Northern California? <laughs> the, uh, the other question was the full electric vehicle, and uh, I have driven the EV. Uh, it's a wonderful vehicle. Unfortunately, um, they only produce 300 of them, and then they immediately shut off production, and almost everything that they burned went into the Honda Insight. And so the electric power steering system, the regenerative braking systems, the nickel metal hydride battery storage systems were all taken from the EV. Um, that there is talk about bringing in another hybrid by Honda in the in the fit in the vehicle that's coming out next that's month. It, it, it's, a, it's, okay. it's not a, it's not a full electric vehicle. It is a gasoline powered vehicle. That's what it was. That's what I saw. Let me show you a picture of, well, the, the car that's been at the uh, auto shows here recently is not, is not this fuel cell. This fuel cell car is, uh, this is being driven by an American family, maybe much like yours or mine. They're leasing it from Honda. That car, uh, or one like it, has been EPA approved to be on U.S. highways near you since June of 2002. It's, one of them's been operating since December of 02, and I experienced it in September of 03, okay? They've come up with a really snazzy looking one that they've been showing at the Detroit Auto Show and the Tokyo Auto Show, but it's, it's not called the Fit. Uh, the Fit does look something like this, but this is actually a two-door hatchback, and the Fit is a, is a five-door, it's a four-door hatchback. Um, How much is that Fit going to be? Under fourteen thousand for the uh, for the base model, and then they're going to have an upgrade model. Uh, I think there was another hand back in that corner. No, it was just about plug-in hybrids. Plug-in hybrids, okay. Uh, there, there is a manufacturer that's bringing out flexible solar panels that can go onto the roof. Um, it's SolaTechLLC.com. SolaTechLLC.com, and. They've got a picture of a Prius with four solar panels and the wiring to do some charging, whether it's sitting or moving. And a question here, sir. Yes. Um, the lithium ion and the nickel hydrogen. What I know is nickel hydrogen is recycled. But what about the lithium ion? I mean, the lithium, I think it's rare metal, so is it recycled or not? See, that, that's a good point, too, the environmental sensitivity. Um, Honda does require a core. Uh, no, no consumer has ever paid for a nickel metal hydride battery from Honda. Okay, that's how um, how supportive they've been. I'm not saying there hasn't been failures. Obviously, the reason that I have one, this failure took place in Hawaii, so I've got one here. But they require a core. So Honda is going to take this system back, the one that has failed, and they're going to then analyze it to see. Do we have environmental solutions, that, uh, engineering solutions that should take place here? And then make a change in it and bring that out in the new ones. Do we have a system that should be remanufactured? 
Maybe there's a couple of cells that are failed. They will then recycle those cells and then put new ones in there and put a remanufactured solution on our shelves in our parts department that would be less money than a brand new system. Okay? And my guess is, without having researched and not to be totally um, on, on key with this, but lithium ion batteries could also end up going through a similar procedure that would make sure that they don't just end up in the skunk river, you know. So uh, hopefully, but how, how we mine stuff out of Mother Earth is a concern too, you know, and let's not, let's not overlook that, that issue. Uh, any other questions on hybrid vehicles? But before I answer any more, if you do need to leave, and I do understand that, and you would like some contact information, um, what I'll do is, uh, let me just move some of this to the back so that you won't have to come out front here. Thank you, John. And uh, please help yourself on the back table back there. That's great. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. He 
said, oh, I'll accept that original data. And you know why he did? Because the data that I faxed him was a whole lot better than what there was. So all you have to do is to go to any source that you want to on the internet, kdm.com, evans.com, punch in a Civic EX, punch in a Civic Hybrid from all three, punch in the same miles and the same condition, and you're going to find out something very interesting. $2,390 difference between Civic to Civic closest has now become $3,900. The hybrid has an additional $1,000, over $1,000 of additional resale value. So who really cares if you have to drive it for 7.9 years to break even on the gasoline when you can do that at resale value from the moment that you drive out of it? But this year, the new energy bill says you get a $2,100 tax credit in investing in a Civic Hybrid. Not a $2,000 tax deduction that it had that. For most Americans, a $2,000 tax deduction turns out to be four to 600 bucks in their pocket. Now we're talking about $2,100 of the now $2,500 difference. So now we're only making up 400 bucks, not the whole amount. And to do 400 bucks, you know, you can, you can figure out how long it takes. You can do the math here with that, with that board right there. Yes, sir. Um, how would you uh, state that hybrids aren't really solving our dependency on oil, but really it's going to get to the future? That's a very good point. And a great point for me to transition into compressed natural gas vehicles. <laughs> we are talking about reducing our dependency on foreign oil. We certainly will not be eliminating it if we're talking about hybrids. So compressed natural gas, the federal government measures it. It, like gasoline, is continually bouncing in supply and demand patterns and continually to go up. But when the government takes a snapshot Every year, they publish it in the EPA gas mileage guide. And last year, that guide said that compressed natural gas, gas, uh, gas gallon equivalent, GGE, natural gas was 80 cents a, a, a gallon less than gasoline. This year, 95 cents a gallon less. If we take a look at Mother Earth, and we take a look at the rate at which we're using gasoline and natural gas and the known reserves. We have twice as much natural gas as we do gasoline. But I did say twice as much, didn't I? Not in an unlimited amount. We have another non-renewable energy source. But a non-renewable energy source that is available greater and it's piped all around the country, by the way. We use natural gas in my home. We use natural gas in my business. So I could actually, I could actually get a box that looks just like this. And this box is Phil, P-H-I-L-L. -L. And Phil is about half the size of a golf uh, bag. And you could put this in your garage, and you could fill your compressed natural gas in the privacy of your own home. <laughs> That'd be pretty cool. For 95 cents a gallon less than gasoline? That'd be really neat. And it would be a partial zero emission vehicle. 98% fewer hydrocarbons. Cleanest internal combustion engine ever tested by the EPA. Okay? But the reason that I like to talk about compressed natural gas vehicles is because of that fuel cell that I showed you earlier. And here's another picture of one. This is a fuel cell right on the lot, uh, in the, the campus at Torrance, California, where I was in September of 03. I could have taken this picture. And what you can't see, but what I'm telling you is, here's an array of solar panels. And these solar panels collect electricity, and they perform electrolysis on water. Now, Mother Earth is covered 70% with water. That's why the Earth they find in blue. 
You can take water and electricity provided renewably and perform electrolysis and separate the H2 from the O and take the hydrogen and compress it to 5,000 pounds per square inch, put it in the tank of this vehicle, it reformulates the water, making the only emissions water vapor. Now, wait a minute. We started with water. And we added a renewable energy source, and we end up with water. What could be better than that? Well, maybe in five years, I come back to Iowa State, and it seems like if we learn anything from history, we're doomed to repeat it. And maybe in five years, I'm, hey, how about those exciting new steam-powered cars? <laughs> I don't know. See, that's where you come in. That's where the young minds of today have got to be coming up with the solutions for tomorrow. Now, I'm trying to do my part to make the world a cleaner, better place to live in. And I hope that my children and my grandchildren will do that also. But we need to have people who are willing to overlook some of the boundaries that are there. We didn't used to think we could do things like this. But we can. And we're going to have to. We're going to have to. So that is hybrids, compressed natural gas. Oh, wait a minute. I forgot to mention. Compressed natural gas. You let into the fuel cells. Where do you get where do you get all the solar energy? We had some today in Iowa, but we don't have it all the time. When we were traveling past the, the wind generators, my mom saying, Well, what if the wind isn't blowing? Well then we don't have renewable energy, do we? What if we could take natural gas and we could reform it and we could produce hydrogen and be able to have that compressed net, that natural gas that's flowing all around our country, we just solved the infrastructure challenge. And eventually, the next time our gas station needs a new awning, they can put up a solar panel. Maybe if they're out in the rural area, they can put up a wind generator. Maybe if they're along the Mississippi River, they can put in hydroelectric. Maybe if they're a farmer in Baldwin, Wisconsin, that will be visiting on Earth Day, he'll take how manure and turn it into natural gas that can be burned in a compressed natural gas city. So don't let anybody put hurdles in your way that can't be put up, that can't be jumped over. Yes, sir. You talked about a compressed natural gas. Uh, what are the like, miles per gallon rating for that compressed gas in terms of like miles per compared to cost per mile? That's a great question. We are talking about the cost. But the, the miles per gallon is, is lower. There's not as much energy in a liter of, of, uh, of, of uh, compressed natural gas. Compressed natural gas civics are rated at 30 and 34 <coughs> compared to 30 and 38. So you do suffer a little bit. It's not a lot, a lot of it, huh? It does require a larger tank, and you're losing a little bit of your storage capacity. Maybe uh, every once in a while you might have to put a bike rack off the back or choose a rooftop solution. But it can be done, and so it's not very different in terms of its mileage. But it is a little bit. I think there was one other question back for you. Yeah. Uh, we need to be out of this room by 8 o'clock, so mm -hmm. if you guys have a few more questions, and then uh, maybe you could talk about it. I'll swear. Yeah. Uh, after that, if you have more questions, uh, that's still what you we'll, we'll answer some more questions, and then for anyone who's interested, we can move out to my hybrid vehicle in the loop out here, and I'll be happy to answer any more questions that you might have. Thank you so much for coming out this evening. Great questions, lots of wonderful <laughs> interest. I really feel very heartened when I have an audience like this, so thank you very much.